Hello, everybody, and welcome to lecture 12, which is the second of two lectures that we're having on glaciers. And in lecture 11, we covered the definition of what a glacier is, as well as how they fit into the overall water cycle. We also talked about different physical forms of glaciers, like alpine and valley glaciers, and then also what happens to glaciers when they reach the ocean. Today's lecture focuses on how glaciers move during the first half, and then in lecture 12b, We'll talk about glacial erosion. What happens to the rock that is broken down by the glacier? Because as it turns out, the main sculptor of landforms in Antarctica is glaciers. Erosion in most parts of the world is mostly by liquid water, carving valleys and canyons and um, removing rock material. But in Antarctica, that role is taken by glaciers because Antarctica is mostly covered by glaciers. So a couple things, there is a lab Remember that is due on Friday, May 7th. That is the fossils of Antarctica lab. There's also a colloquium happening this week. On Thursday, we have two grad students who are presenting their work. One of them will be talking about rifts um, or divergent plate boundaries. So the main Ethiopian rift is actually a place where a mid-ocean ridge like we learned about existing around Antarctica and also forming in the Atlantic Ocean, um, how that starts on land. and. The other will be talking about phosphor, um, phosphorus cycles. Um, and there and how that connects to and how that connects to evolution, actually, how that connects to how that connects to the how that connects to the anyhow, to to ancient evolution. Anyhow, um, if you attend this particular colloquium, you can devote half of your extra credit paper to each of the two talks. And in total, the assignment can be the same length as a paper about a single presentation. So in other words, you don't have to write twice as much for this. Um, we will be moving into the human history of Antarctica next week. And next week, I will also have midterm, midterm averages to report. Your scores should be ready to view though. And I have incorporated any extra credit points that you've submitted either as write-ups for colloquia or write-ups on hikes or from watching documentaries or from taking the practice quiz, those points have indeed been added. If you have questions about that, let me know right away. Um, I have been keeping track of the points separately. I also wanted to mention again that rating assignment number two is now open. It is not due until May 30th at 1159 p.m. on Gaucho Space. It is going to be very similar in overall how it's going to look and what type of work it's going to be to reading assignment number one. However, this time, instead of writing about a news article, you're writing about a scientific journal article, one that is detailing research and written by the scientists themselves and that has been peer reviewed by others. And if you want to check whether a, an article is peer reviewed, what you want to do is find the website of the publishing journal itself, like nature or atmospheric chemistry or whatever the journal is called. And in their info, they should list whether their articles are fact checked and checked for consistency and looked over for content by scientists who are within the same field as the scientists who published the paper, but who don't have any immediate connection to it. That's what it means by peer review. And that's important because the idea is that papers that are accepted by academic journals have been looked at by someone else in the field to make sure that this is within the boundaries of what this, that this is reasonable within the boundaries of what we know about the field, that the research is consistent, etc. What you have to do is pick a paper and it does not have to be as long or as dense as the article about the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. I realize that article scared a few people, but no, it can be something shorter or very easily more decipherable than that. And what you need to do is read that paper and write a 400 word response in which you address what were the research goals of the author or authors who wrote the paper. And that is usually pretty to easy to find when you just look at the abstract. They will list what they're, they will list somewhere in there pretty early on what the problem is, what they're trying to solve or what they're trying to improve. And the introduction will, out, will outline that in a bit more detail also. And then you want to talk about what are their results and why their results are important. Um, and the authors will, in the section that's entitled results, indicate what 
what they found. And then in the discussion, which is usually a separate section, sometimes it's bundled together, but in the discussion section, they will talk about how and why their results are actually meaningful. And then they should also address whether their results were what they were expecting. And that's something you should bring up in your response too. You also need to make sure that there's a link to the article. I hope that that is helpful. Um, feel free to bounce article ideas off me and I can also recommend articles if you have any particular subjects that you're interested in. And yes, if you're interested in talking about the human history of Antarctica, then you can do a write up on a historical or social science based article on Antarctica too. Feel free to bounce that off me if you want me to check. Moving on from that, today's lecture material will be first about how glaciers move and we'll start with another category of glacier and that is warm warm versus cold based glaciers and we'll talk about what that means for antarctic glaciers then we'll get some information about how glaciers move glaciers it turns out have several different mechanisms for moving and they also respond to stress in different ways depending on a variety of factors so lecture 12b focuses on what happens to the rocks that the glacier is traveling over in a non-polar environment, the biggest sculpture of the land into mountains and valleys is going to be liquid water, but in Antarctica, because we don't have a lot of liquid water, the main agent of erosion is instead glaciers. And we'll talk about what that means for erosion in Antarctica and what types of sediments and rocks are produced by that. And remember that we talked a bit about the specific types of sediments that are produced by glaciers when I talked about continental drift and plate tectonics and how finding those sedimentary deposits helped indicate that the continents had moved from their current position at some point. So this is a separate set of categories from the previous lecture in which we went over a number of types of glacier that were defined by their shape. Continental glaciers like ice caps and ice sheets, which are not defined by their surrounding topography, and then various cirque glaciers, alpine glaciers, valley glaciers, tidewater glaciers, and such that are def defined by what they flow through or where they end up in the case of tidewater glaciers or um, or outflow glaciers more broadly. Tidewater glaciers are one type of outflow glacier. But separately from all of this, there is another category of glacier. Some glaciers, whether they're continental or whether, whether they're alpine or valley or tidewater, some glaciers are considered to be cold based and some are warm based. And an important term that I want to go over a little bit here is the term the pressure melting temperature. And I've mentioned the fact that there is a temperature at which liquid water freezes to ice and vice versa when water um, when ice melts into liquid water. And that temperature is dependent on what the pressure is. If the pressure changes, the temperature at which solid water changes to liquid water, that changes. So if the pressure increases, remember, the pressure melting temperature is going to drop. If you have more pressure, it's easier for liquid water to exist because the melting temperature drops. You can have liquid water at lower temperatures. And that's like what happens with subglacial lakes. That's why we have significant amounts of water under the glaciers in places like Lake Vostok. And so what happens is that as you go from the top of a glacier to the bottom of a glacier, the pressure is increasing from the overlying weight of the ice. The bottom of the glacier is going to be under higher pressure than the top of the glacier. And this is where, so in general, you might expect there to be a little bit of liquid water at the bottom of glaciers, because at the bottom of glaciers, the pressure is high enough um, that you can actually have a little bit of liquid water. Now we have two diagrams here because it turns out there are two situations. You'll notice that between these two diagrams, the pressure melt temperature is the same. The pressure melt temperature, which is represented by the dotted line, that's just for water. That doesn't change whether it's a cold base or warm base glacier. This is the ice temperature profile. This shows how the ice temperature changes from the top to the bottom of a cold base glacier. And then this is how it changes from the top to the bottom of a warm base glacier. So in polar regions like Antarctica and Greenland, we have cold base glaciers. In Alpine areas like the Himalaya, the Andes Mountains, or Glacier National Park in Montana, we have warm-based glaciers. 
regarding cold based glaciers. In the polar regions, the weak sunlight very ineffectively heats the surface of the glacier. And in fact, the ice ends up being warmer near the bottom because of geothermal heat, because of the heat from the Earth. And notice in the diagram on the left how the line showing ice temperature from the top of the ice column to the bottom does not intersect the pressure melt temperature at all. So what that means is that, is that the glacier isn't going to experience much melting at any depth. No matter where you go in the glacier from top to bottom, it's going to be too cold for much liquid water to exist. So even though the bottom is warmer than the top, the bottom is still cold. It's much colder than the pressure melting temperature and thus too cold for liquid water to form. Now, glaciers that are forming in mountainous regions of more tropical or temperate latitudes will experience stronger sunlight and thus be warmer overall. And especially at the surface, this will be the case. Now, the ice gets colder the farther down you get from the warmer solar radiation. And as you move down the ice in a warm base glacier, it turns out the ice temperature just about follows the pressure melting temperature. This means that while you can have ice, you can also have liquid water forming in considerable amounts. If it's right along the line, that means you can have both some liquid water and some solid water, some ice. And warm base or temperate glaciers tend to have liquid water that is lubricating them as they move over land. That is something we don't see very much of in Antarctica. And that is the other big important definition with glaciers, aside from the various physical forms that they have. Now, regarding how glaciers build up, Remember that on land, a glacier moves. The ice in the glacier moves from where it is accumulating, as in where snow is piling up and forming into ice in excess, down to where it is ablating, or where the glacier is experiencing a net loss of mass because melting, calving, and sublimation outweigh any snowfall. The ice mass balance of a glacier is the value representing the balance between accumulation and ablation of snow. It's going to be a positive number in the zone of accumulation, and it's going to be a negative number in the zone of ablation. If the ice mass balance is zero, we are at the point of equilibrium. And indeed, on a glacier, scientists can define a line of equilibrium representing the line, one that usually coincides with a topographic line showing elevation. And that is a line between the zone of accumulation and the zone of ablation. And scientists will study this to see if the equilibrium lines appearing, appear to be moving. If the equilibrium lines are moving downhill into the zone of ablation, then the glacier might be expanding. The zone of accumulation is getting bigger. But if the equilibrium lines move uphill, then they are moving into the zone of accumulation, meaning that the zone of accumulation is getting smaller and the zone of ablation is getting bigger. So scientists look to see where equilibrium lines move on a glacier. And Here's a visual display of them. You can see that we have two glaciers in this figure that feed into each other to become a single glacier. And notice how snow and neve, which is granular snow, sort of in between being snow and ice, the snow and neve above the equilibrium line are forming a layer on top of the glacier ice. And that's where the glacier is building up. The snow and neve are building up and causing the glacier to accumulate. Below this equilibrium line, you don't have that accumulation forming. Below the equilibrium line, you have ice, but it's progressively getting smaller and smaller as you move downhill because it's it's ablating. It's being it's being broken off and evaporated into non-existence. And the two glaciers each have equilibrium lines corresponding to the altitude above which snowfall overall causes the glacier to grow. You can see that this line of equilibrium in the left glacier is at the same altitude as this one in the right glacier. As the glaciers merge and move downhill, there isn't going to be as much snowfall and the glacier is going to get smaller and weaker until it breaks up and melts before moving any farther. And at the toes of the glacier that you can see in the picture, that's where much of the sediment that's being carried under or on top of the glaciers is getting deposited. And notice how there's a number of ridges at the end. Um, there's one ridge right at the end of the glacier, then one further out, and then one even further out. And that marks, the, and the one closest marks the present end of the glacier. These other ones mark the previous maximum extents of the glacier. So the glacier in this picture is retreating. It's getting smaller because you have these ridges known as terminal moraines that are farther out, indicating that the glacier used to be farther out than where it ends presently. Now, glaciers move, and they move in one of two ways. You, you might think that a glacier is going to slide downhill like a block because it's made of solid ice, and we think solid things sort of slide downhill. And glaciers do actually move like that sometimes. But as we'll find out, that is actually less common in Antarctica for the reasons I described earlier, and that is that there is little meltwater.
Glaciers in Antarctica largely move via plastic flow. When the ice in the glaciers being pulled downhill by the force of gravity reshapes itself, rearranges itself, and actually flows like an extremely slow, thick fluid downslope without the ice breaking and forming cracks. A lot of this involves the layers of ice rearranging and the ice crystals changing shapes slowly. Plastic flow happens when a glacier is moving under conditions of continuous stress or relatively low amounts of stress. As it turns out, basal sliding often happens much more um, under relatively sudden sources of stress um, and is more likely to be accompanied by brittle deformation. So what causes basal sliding? The basal sliding largely needs lubrication from meltwater to happen. And it tends to happen in a sort of herky-jerky stop and go fashion because the lubrication comes from meltwater that may not be a constant presence. Remember that if you go back to the diagram showing the pressure melt temperature and the ice temperature, I'll jump back there for a moment. Notice it's right along the line. And that means that you don't necessarily have a lot of meltwater forming. The ice isn't melting completely. There's just a little bit of meltwater forming. So, Periodically, you're going to get a buildup of meltwater that's going to reduce the friction enough that the glacier is going to lurch forward a bit and then kind of get stuck to the next point. And basal sliding happens a lot more in the summer than in the winter because in the summer there's more meltwater. Um, and it also happens much more continuously and constantly in temperate glaciers, known as warm base glaciers, as opposed to cold base or polar glaciers like you have in Antarctica. A single glacier is going to be experiencing a combination of basal sliding and plastic flow in different areas. Basal slip will actually often occur where the pressure is highest, since that allows meltwater to build up, and where the pressure is less, such as in the front of the glacier shown in the example on the lower right, you instead have plastic deformation dominating. Notice also a comparison between movement and the ice marked along the dotted line in the lower left diagram. In a polar glacier, since there is so little meltwater formation, internal or plastic deformation dominates throughout the end. You can see that it looks like the whole starting line has been warped in the direction of glacier movement. But with a temperate glacier, you can see that the dotted line is much more vertical because to some extent, rather than being sheared and warped by plastic deformation, it has also slid down to the right via basal slip. In short, basal slip is overall less dominant in Antarctic glaciers due to the lower amount of meltwater. Now, the important thing to understand about ice is that ice, when it is subjected to constant or relatively low pressure, will warp rather than breaking and forming cracks. It will deform plastically, just like the asthenosphere, the ductile layer of Earth over which the rigid plates in the lithosphere flow. And one example of a possible process is shown in the diagram to the lower left, where an ice crystal that is undeformed prior to the movement of the glacier is slid in layers to the right, with the dislocation occurring along planes in the direction of glacial movement. And if you're wondering why it appears stacked like it is, and with each layer a bit shifted, it's because the top layer of the crystal is dragged the most, and it drags the underlying layer, but less strongly because some of the force is lost to friction, and so on and so forth down. It is actually quite similar to Ekman transport in that fashion. And the ice crystals can slide past one another, they can rotate, and they can even rearrange on the atomic level to avoid having the ice break if the stress level is relatively low or continuous. Glaciers are brought under stress by friction with the underlying ground, as well as by the downward pull of gravity. It turns out that the ground and factors like what types of rock make up the bedrock, whether it's hard rock or soft rock, whether it's igneous or sedimentary or metamorphic, etc., that can all play a role in when plastic deformation gives way to what we would call brittle failure. And I have a little bit of a preview of a um, video that the TAs are having you, the TAs are having you um, look at for lab. This is a way to model glaciers without actually bringing the entire laboratory down to freezing temperature. It's a flubber model using a using kind of a silly putty type substance, a substance that is solid and that will flow, but that it's kind of like butter, it'll flow downhill. But then if you if you like stick a spoon in it really suddenly, it'll crack. Um, I 
butter is one butter butter is one type of solid like that like butter will kind of if you put butter on a on a slope it'll start to kind of flow downhill but if you suddenly put a spoon in butter it'll it'll break in half and that is what glaciers are like now notice that notice that they've drawn these lines in here they've drawn these lines to um I'll hold off until a moment, but they've drawn those lines to show how some parts of the glacier move faster than others. You'll notice that the, the nose of the lines is going forward, and that's because the center of the glacier is moving much faster. The glacier is experiencing friction. It's experiencing friction on the sides and the bottom from whatever the surface is in this tube that they've put. The glacier in the middle is getting less friction. So the part that's experiencing less friction is going to flow faster. And you can see that the lines that they drew, which were originally fairly straight across, they've become really warped because the center is going faster than the sides, significantly faster, actually. This is quite a bit sped up. Glaciers don't move this fast. And actually, neither does the silly putty material, even though it's not a perfect model. It doesn't necessarily simulate erosion. It doesn't necessarily simulate melting. Um, it doesn't necessarily simulate meltwater formation is what I meant last time. It doesn't necessarily simulate crevasse formation. But it does simulate the speed by which glaciers flow fairly well. And it also does a nice job of, um, I think in here it's somewhere they, they sort of give you an indication of what, like what happens to glaciers when they flow under different types of surfaces. Um, but anyhow. The TAs have that video linked in their um, in their introductory presentation, or actually it's linked within the lab itself. That will be next week's lab. That will be the Glaciers Lab that is going to be released next week and do, do a week from this Friday. And that's just a little bit of a preview of one way to model glaciers outside of, outside of a natural environment. Now, I mentioned crevasses or cracks in the glacier. And Brittle failure involves breaking. The ice crystals, instead of rearranging or shifting around, will instead tear apart from one another under large or sudden forces. And one example of what can cause this is when the underlying topography somehow becomes rougher. The glacier starts to flow over a rock type that is harder and more resistant to erosion, or it's flowing over a bump, or a possibly both. The bumps are actually often rock that is more resistant. Um, and the disturbance caused by the presence of a boulder, a mound, or resistant rock will cause the ice to slow down when compared to the ice around it. And this often rapidly, this often is quick enough that the plastic deformation doesn't fix the disturbance and a crack forms in the ice. And this crack is known as a crevasse. And many of them are quite large and deep. They are extremely dangerous for Antarctic explorers. And while well, I didn't have to do this because I wasn't crossing the glaciers on foot, my some of my colleagues who went the next year and went to an area where they were walking on glaciers more, they had to do crevasse. They had to do crevasse prevention training, or like like crevasse safety awareness training, something like that. And um, they had to learn how they had to do basic training to learn how to deal with the situation in case one of your team members falls into one. Hopefully not. They form and disappear periodically with changes in a glacier's flow pattern, and they can be thought of as blisters in a sense because they form from disturbance and they will sometimes they will sometimes close up and then reappear again as glaciers flow at different speeds um, in different years or possibly seasonally. Glaciers, excuse me, crevasses also often form when a glacier is forced to make a relatively sharp turn, and we'll see a couple of, of examples of that on the next slide. And where the glacier makes a rapid turn, the ice will experience brittle failure, like you can see in these examples here. Actually, this is a good example of a mound, of a glacier forming crevasses as it flows over a mound. A mound often made of rock that is more resistant and doesn't as quickly get ground down by the glacier. And the crevasses in the left are forming from that relatively sudden disturbance. And the right, meanwhile, the, in, the, in the example on the right, the glacier is coming around a sharp turn, and the part of the ice on the inside of the turn is experiencing pretty intense sudden stress from this and undergoing brittle failure and crevasse formation as a result. On the outside of the turn, where the ice has a bit more time and space for the crystals to rearrange, plastic deformation still dominates, and you have quite fewer crevasses forming. So a quick review. 
movement within a single glacier is going to be complicated and it'll depend on factors such as the strength and type of the underlying and surrounding bedrock, the shape of the surrounding topography, where the equilibrium lines are, and what sort of turns a glacier makes on its route. Glaciers can move as a concrete piece, as a single piece and undergo basal slip, when meltwater at the base lubricates them enough for this to happen. This is going to occur in the highest pressure areas since high pressure creates more liquid water, and this is going to be less common in polar regions like Antarctica. Glaciers largely move via plastic flow in places like Antarctica, where the ice changes shape and deforms without breaking. Crevasses form when glaciers undergo sudden disturbances by flowing over hard rock, mounds, or around corners. Now, during the second half of the lecture, one example of glacial erosion we'll talk about is an interesting example that occurs when glaciers exit the stage of flowing over a mound of more resistant rock and start to undergo plastic deformation again. That is plucking. So the next half of the lecture will be all about what glaciers do to the rock around them as they move. They break that rock down into tiny pieces. And that's the subject of the next half of the lecture.